We welcome all of you to our webinar on Understanding Gender Dysphoria. I'm Tom Sheehan, the director of iTest. For those of you who are newcomers to iTest, attending one of our webinars for the first time, I want to explain that iTest is short for, or stands for, the Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology. Our organization has been active at the interface between religious faith and science for over 50 years. We've conducted conferences, seminars, webinars, and other activities that address issues, sometimes controversial, where science bears upon some religious topic. The mission of iTest is as follows. To influence decisions and policy in human communities, iTest fosters and disseminates the position that science and faith in God are complementary paths to human fulfillment. That notion of complementary paths is a cornerstone of iTest purpose. We realize that it's quite at odds with the conventional view of science against faith that is often promoted in the public square. Generally, our conferences and webinars strive to bring out the unity between faith and science that is sometimes hidden. In any individual webinar, the purpose is not to provide some right answer, but to leave our attendees in a better informed position to make their own decisions. The topic of gender dysphoria is a very new one. To seniors like myself, it's bewildering. It's far away, foreign, unfamiliar, and we cannot understand where it came from. However, to many young people, it's very real and of immediate daily concerns. For the teachers and school settings, it has to be addressed. The first step towards addressing any problem is to understand it. And that is why we've entitled this webinar, Understanding Gender Dysphoria. In keeping with ITES primary goal for any webinar, we don't claim to have the right answer, but we hope to improve your understanding of this topic. ITES physical headquarters are at the Cardinal Regali Center in St. Louis, the Archdiocesan Central Office Building. However, today we are coming to you via Zoom from locations in several different states and different time zones. To begin today's program, I'm going to call upon Father Tom Davis of the Liberty Institute for Faith and Ethics to offer an opening prayer. Father Davis. Thank you, Tom. Good morning. I'm delighted to join again with iTest in this series of fascinating webinars that explore, as Tom has described, very important questions in the interface of science, theology, technology, and to be offered the opportunity to open our session with a prayer. Look forward to a fascinating discussion about these confusing topics that have so many ramifications for children, for adults, for society, for families. And I hope we get a deeper insight into that from our two very fine presenters today. So please join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, you have brought us into being out of nothingness, formed us in your image and likeness, male and female, you have created us so that together we may complete the unity of your image and share in your creative glory. Today we gather to explore challenges to your freedom, challenges that question the meaning of human nature and the inherent goodness of your design. Accept our entreaty that you may open our hearts and minds to the riches of your plan and the beauty of your created order. Fill our hearts and fill the hearts of those confused by the social and cultural streams that have flooded our world, subjecting the gift of sexuality to manipulation and grant them the grace to welcome the gift of their femininity and masculinity. Strengthen those ministering to all who suffer over the confusion rampant in society, counselors, spiritual advisors, healthcare providers, that they may grow in fortitude and in all virtue as they offer true friendship, affection and witness to your love. Encourage the downhearted, enlighten those in doubt, preserve and protect families, especially parents who struggle and witness to the glory of your gifts that they may offer their example as models to others. Open the minds of those charged with the formation of social and legal policy 
to recognize the inherent characteristics embodied of embodied sexuality as the pinnacle of your expression of love. We ask all this as we praise and glorify your most magnificent name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and always and forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Davis. Now, to begin our program today, first, I want to draw your attention to the icon labeled Q&A at the bottom of your screen. That is where we invite you to submit any questions that may occur to you as we proceed along. After our two major presentations, there will be a question and answer session. Sheila Roth of ITEST, located at our St. Louis headquarters, will collect questions submitted via the Q&A tab and will select certain questions to be directed to each speaker. We are anticipating a lively exchange of ideas today. I also point out the distinctly different chat icon at the bottom of the screen. That is not for questions. It is a kind of side conference room where individuals um, can uh, send messages to each other. So please understand that if you're in the chat room, that won't be in the public part of the questions. Well, now we are ready to begin. Our first speaker today is Dr. Paul Ruse. Paul W. Ruse, MD and PhD, is an academic pediatric endocrinologist that is a hormone specialist and tenured physician scientist with faculty um, appointments in both pediatrics and cellular biology and physiology. Dr. Ruiz has over 20 years of clinical experience in caring for children with disorders of sexual development. He has received certification in healthcare ethics from the National Catholic Bioethics Center and is a regular contributor to his university's course on research ethics for graduate students. He has authored over 60 peer-reviewed manuscripts, scientific reviews, and book chapters. Together with his wife, Ann, he has raised his five children in St. Louis. Dr. Ruse. Well, I want to welcome all of you who are here on this uh, webinar uh, for attending this conference. And I very much look forward uh, to presenting to you um, my perspective as a uh, physician and scientist uh, on this topic of gender dysphoria. Uh, before I begin, I do need to make a disclosure uh, that I am not representing my university or, or the uh, St. Louis Children's Hospital uh, in this presentation. I wanna begin uh, by just acknowledging the topic that we're talking about relates to that of identity. And what we mean by that is who we are as human persons, uh, the actual reality of who we are, but also how we perceive ourselves uh, within ourselves and in relation to community. And, and this is a topic uh, that is very, um, often a fraught with uh, lots of emotion. And, and I want to be able to, to back away from the emotive responses and in, in much of the dialogue that's going on in, in the political arena and really focus on the question of science and, and best medical practice to help you to understand uh, this very unique uh, patient uh, population. And that this, this is uh, individuals who experience a real um, perception of their identity, their gender identity, uh, that is uh, disconnected uh, with their uh, biological uh, sex. And before I begin, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as understanding the terminology that is being used in this discussion, uh, because I think words are very important as how we use them and how we understand them. And there are many terms that are often used. In fact, the term sex and gender are often used interchangeably when they really reflect two different uh, uh, entities or um, aspects of this question of, of human sexuality. And as I talk about this from the perspective of, as a scientist and, and a physician, uh, the biological understanding of sex as being intrinsically oriented toward the process of reproduction. And this is true not only in human beings, but also across the animal kingdom and the specific roles of males and females in that reproductive process. So when we talk about males, uh, these are members of a species uh, that donate gen genetic information for humans uh, in the form of sperm to a female recipient. And the female uh, adds their uh, own genetic information uh, from the egg uh, to generate that new human life. 
Now, this is not a controversial topic. This is something that we've always understood, and you probably uh, have a good grasp of that. It's the second term on this list here, that of gender, which really has taken on the uh, public discussion and really, really getting an understanding of what that uh, is referring to. As we will uh, refer to it this morning, it is the social and cultural expression of being masculine or feminine. But by dissociating these two terms of sex and gender, that's not to imply uh, that they are entirely distinct. In fact, as we'll see, they are intrinsically related to each other uh, in how individuals uh, come together uh, to participate in that uh, reproductive act. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, in, uh, people that have um, gender identities that are not in accord with their biological sex. And so to understand that gender identity um, is a person's perception of being male or female. And while we're not going to directly talk about sexual orientation, uh, it does have uh, a connection to this whole discussion of sexuality. Uh, and I'm just going to very briefly just mention that, that in relation to that uh, ordering of our uh, gender and sex, as, as we have defined them, that we can learn um, quite a bit just by looking at the physical form of the body in relation to its and, and knowing that the anatomical features of the human body are by design directed toward that reproductive process. And so that when we think about gender, it's not only in bringing people together of male and female uh, forms uh, to be able to participate in that sexual act. Uh, the gender uh, also plays a role in, in how we raise the children that are, are the product of that uh, sexual encounter. Uh, and many times uh, it is, at least today, it's being put forward that, um, that sex uh, occurs along a continuum. And I just want to acknowledge that in my medical practice and in, in the care of individuals that are born with ambiguous genitalia, um, that these are, are, are people um, that do exist, uh, but it doesn't change that fundamental understanding of the human person as being created male versus female. And um, really to, to understand that, there really are two and only two um, gonads, uh, testes and ovaries, that participate in that reproductive process. Generally speaking, uh, people that have these differences, these disorders of sexual development, are going to encounter impairments in their ability to participate uh, in that reproductive function. Um, so we need to be able to think about this in, in that terms, but then acknowledge that this is a, uh, an experience, this gender dysphoria uh, that a growing number of, of people in our society are experiencing conveys a sense of discomfort and distress um, that's experienced by people um, who have this uh, self-identity uh, with a gender that is not uh, in alignment with their biological sex. And, and this term of gender dysphoria actually came about more recently uh, within our, our uh, medical uh, terminology uh, as, a, as a shift from the original understanding of this condition uh, as uh, being a, a disorder, gender identity disorder. And this came out in the fifth edition of the diagnostic manual that psychiatrists use to classify uh, various psychological conditions. And it really was an ideological based effort to remove any pathologic stigma that's associated uh, with these individuals with sex gender discordance. Uh, and uh, the reason that's in the manual itself is, is to justify medical interventions to align the, the physical appearance of the body to um, coincide with one's gender identity. Uh, there's more, uh, there's uh, many that would actually like to get that out of the diagnostic manual entirely. But these, this is the patient population that I'm going to focus on this morning, those that experience uh, this gender dysphoria. And the reason why it's coming to medical attention is because it is very well established that people that suffer from gender dysphoria have um, very serious suffering. And, and this includes a very alarming rate of suicidal ideation and attempted suicide, uh, uh, substance abuse, uh, depression, anxiety, mood disorders, um, being a uh, high uh, incidence of homelessness and, and HIV infection and other uh, morbidities. And so this is something that we're uh, approaching from a medical standpoint to try to alleviate that suffering that people are encountering. And, and I think it's not an understatement to say that these people that experience gender dysphoria are literally crying out for help. 
They're coming to physicians and the medical establishment to help them with that pain. The question that we must ask is, what is the care that we are providing? And is it in um, truly providing a healing uh, for the suffering that they're experiencing? Certainly, this is a phenomenon that uh, we all know is increasing quite dramatically just in the past you know, uh, decade. Uh, this is a, a, a graph showing data of the number of people presenting for care uh, in one clinic in the United Kingdom, uh, the Tavistock Center. Uh, and the data is helpful because uh, all of the patients that seek this care are referred to a single center. So uh, we can gather together in, in one group, uh, one population, um, uh, all the people that are coming for care. And you can see that it almost exponentially that uh, the number of patients coming forward um, has been increasing. In thinking about the, you know, in looking at the demographics as well, it's not only that the numbers are increasing, uh, there used to be a predominance of biological males um, uh, seeking uh, care to appear as female. And now uh, we are experiencing a, a rapid growth in the number of biological females um, with gender dysphoria that are coming to care um, to be able to um, have bodily changes uh, to appear as male. And there are many questions that we can ask as to why this is the case. Uh, there are concerns about the uh, influence of, of the uh, social contagion. Uh, there's arguments made that these people now have a place to go when they uh, did not in the past. Nevertheless, this is a substantial number of individuals, and by some surveys um, that uh, have their own limitations, up to two to three percent of the population of children are now questioning uh, their, their gender identity. So this is a real phenomenon. This is something that, that is coming on with uh, more frequency, and we need to be mindful of that. And one of the qu first questions when we talk about medical interventions is, try, is to try to understand the causes or the etiology uh, of any condition. And certainly there have been many efforts that have been put forward to understand uh, sex uh, gender identity discordance. Um, and, and this includes understanding environmental uh, contributors, uh, things, for example, uh, by a parental um, and family dynamics uh, of prior uh, events in the childhood relating to physical or psychological uh, abuse, um, questions about uh, social reinforcement. Um, and then there are, are many studies that, that are looking for genetic influences. And in, in looking at, at these influences, um, there really has ne not been uh, a, a clear uh, answer to a genetic basis for this condition. At best, we can say that there are genetic influences that are contributed by a number of different uh, genetic loci um, that all together uh, contribute or at least uh, predispose one perhaps uh, to have this experience where they would maybe have the same environmental factors some individuals uh, would and some would not uh, experiencing gender dysphoria. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest uh, that this is determinative, uh, meaning that if you have this genetic makeup that you are destined to have this outcome. There's also an interesting observation of, of the incidence of uh, markedly elevated in incidence of uh, this condition in, in children with uh, autism. But the best that we can say is that uh, we don't know the answer to that question. Um, there are likely to be multiple influences that differ in any one individual. Now, moving on to the approaches to treatment, one would might be led to believe that there is a, a single unifying approach to the care of individuals that have gender dysphoria, at least by what's portrayed in the media, uh, and that we have all the answers and we know exactly what we're doing. I want to present to you that there, there are several different approaches uh, to this condition, uh, both historically and, and currently. Uh, and the, the historically, um, most of these uh, uh, people that experience sex gender identity discordance uh, were um, uh, given uh, a reparative approach. And, and really, each of the different treatment approaches that I'm going to mention here are based upon fundamental uh, differences in the premises that we have in understanding this condition. So the reparative approach is based upon the premise that the, the difficulty resides within uh, the mind and that the body itself is normal. And the goal is to assist uh, affected patients in accepting their biological sex. Uh, 
And in that approach, the focus is on psychological interventions to alleviate uh, that distress. Uh, and um, that's, this can include uh, investigation into prior abuse or trauma and, and some of those other factors, environmental factors, uh, to be able to, and then also to uh, uh, assist an individual in, in dealing with the associated depression, anxiety, and all of the other comorbidities. It's often said that this reparative approach um, is harmful to these individuals and that it is ineffective, yet that's uh, uh, not a fair assessment of, of the data that we have. And in fact, in many of the papers that are, are cited uh, as being uh, um, proving that it's ineffective actually show patients that uh, individual patients that did have success with this approach. And many of them have rel relied upon psychotherapeutic uh, methods uh, that are now uh, understood to be outdated. And modern psychotherapeutic approaches really have not been experimentally tested in this patient population. So if we're going to uh, assess uh, the treatment approaches from uh, a medical standpoint uh, in an unbiased manter manner, uh, we need to uh, at least consider this uh, as um, a viable scientific question. The second approach is that known as the expected approach or watch and wait. And this is based upon data, at least when we look at uh, children that have sex gender identity discordance, that the vast majority of them in, in um, I would say 85% is a good estimate, will have spontaneous realignment of their gender identity with their biological sex, if merely left alone and supported in other ways. Uh, again, I would add that this is without uh, social affirmation and many of the things that are going on societally in the current day. And again, there have been over a dozen studies over the last 40 years that have shown this outcome. Uh, and these are just listing a few of the papers more recently that have been pl uh, published. I, I must add that when we say uh, expect an approach, it doesn't mean do nothing. And certainly um, this does in, in include uh, uh, addressing the issues of depression, anxiety, and the other comorbidities. And actually, it was the uh, recommended uh, way to manage at least uh, prepubertal children uh, that have this condition. And it does uh, understand desistance as a desirable, even if it's not an intended outcome, meaning that individuals that have the spontaneous realignment of their gender identity with their biological sex are not subject to the uh, subsequent medical interventions that I'm going to mention um, that show to you. Uh, and they wouldn't be uh, tethered to the medical establishment for the rest of their life uh, with all of the attendant risks and benefits. Now, I'm now going to spend uh, most of the rest of my time talking about uh, the affirmative approach because it's become, at least in the United States, the predominant approach based really on one study uh, conducted in, in uh, a Dutch population. Um, and this approach is based upon the premise that gender variation is normal. And in, in fact, um, it, it asserts uh, frequently that uh, the body itself uh, needs to be changed in order to conform with the gender identity so that the mind is normal and the, the body itself um, is not formed properly. Now, this approach includes a number of medical interventions, uh, uh, the first uh, being pubertal blockers, uh, powerful drugs that are given to stop the normal pubertal process of the signals coming from the brain to tell the gonads to work. And this is uh, normally administered uh, at the time uh, of puberty when gender dysphoria uh, increases in an effective patient. And then traditionally, um, in this model, cross-sex hormones, and by that I mean estrogen to a biological um, male who desires to appear female, and testosterone to a biological female that desires to uh, appear male. Uh, and this is uh, offered at 16 years of age. Now, these ages have, have uh, decreased over several years and are now being offered to even younger children. And then, and then uh, the surgical interventions, uh, uh, bilateral mastectomy in females uh, wanting to appear male, uh, breast augmentation surgery um, in, in males, uh, this is referred to as top surgery, and then a smaller subset um, to have surgical um, manipulation of the appearance of the external genitalia. Again, uh, this was reserved for patients 18 years of age or older, and we're seeing that the ages that this is being offered is de decreasing uh, over time as well. And much of uh, this affirmative model is uh, being put forward by professional societies as the uh, preferred and only approach that can be undertaken. And this includes my own professional organization, the Endocrine Society, 
And it's often difficult to even raise questions uh, about uh, this uh, form of uh, uh, intervention. I will state that while it's, put, uh, it's said that this is a consensus statement by these societies, it really reflects only a small sliver of the entire uh, membership of these societies, uh, uh, with the exception of the WPATH, which is, is a, a group of uh, people with particular um, ideological goals uh, in, and really has moved away from its uh, initial um, scientific um, uh, focus. Uh, and really, uh, the entire membership of societies have, have not been able to um, engage in that conversation. Now, in any practice guideline, uh, there is a hierarchy of evidence that is used to support any particular intervention. And for example, in the, in the Endocrine Society guidelines, um, in the, the guidelines themselves, they rate the quality of the evidence. And it's important for one to understand that nearly all of the recommendations that are made for the affirmative approach are based on low or very low quality evidence. The only evidence that reaches the moderate level uh, is on adverse effects. Uh, and by definition, this means that as more information becomes available, it's likely that those recommendations will change. And this is not uh, unique to, to this particular clinical question. We've known that clinical guidelines have changed over time and many times drastically, even 180 degrees in, in a different direction. So the difficulties that we encounter in many of the studies uh, that ha uh, have been published is in this area, um, overall, there are um, a growing number of studies uh, when they first put this forward, um, um, very, very few studies, but of the quality that they um, exist um, have many, many limitations. Uh, it often involves small sample sizes, um, convenient samples, which are prone to bias, including uh, you taking internet surveys, uh, largely uncontrolled design uh, or improper controls. Um, there's an absence of this, the, really the gold standard of, of uh, clinical studies, the randomized controlled trial. Many arguments that are made uh, to say that that's not ethical to conduct a trial in that manner, um, and really disagreement in, in what uh, would uh, be necessary to conduct that trial um, uh, ethically. And, and then particularly in children, short duration of follow-up, uh, and many questions that remain as far as uh, what is the prudent and best approach. Now, when we look at the uh, aspect, even before uh, approaching the medical professionals uh, is that of social affirmation. Uh, and this is where many people are confronted with uh, this condition in, in uh, accepting somebody's uh, changed name, uh, preferred pronoun usage, um, those that are in social situations, uh, you know, try to dress uh, in the appearance of the, their uh, desired uh, sexual identity, and, and to gain access to intimate uh, facilities like bathrooms and locker rooms. And, and this is offered to, to patients um, as early as three years of age or um, at very early on in life. What is important to understand is, is that the scientific evidence for this social affirmation approach, again, like the other interventions, is based on very low quality evidence, generally a handful of short-term studies uh, that show a, an immediate reduction in, in dysphoria. Um, yet um, the, the long-term studies, which have not been done in children, uh, but actually have looked uh, more at adults, uh, can uh, show a persistently high rate of depression and suicide after um, this uh, particular um, approach. Importantly, there have been no randomized control studies on, on pronoun use or bathroom uh, access. Uh, questions that we would normally um, you know, ask and, and study and investigate as to whether this is necessary, prudent, and has long-term benefit for the affected patients. Now, the next step, and this is the first entry into the, um, the clinical arena, is that uh, of the use of puberty, puberal blockade. And again, as I mentioned, these are drugs that shut down uh, puberty. They've been used in, in the pediatric population uh, to, to block abnormal early puberty or precocious puberty. Um, and they've now been introduced uh, to halt um, normally timed puberty with the assumption that in these gender dysphoric youth, that puberty itself is, is a disease. Uh, and it's often claimed that this is safe and fully reversible, um, that it alleviates the dysphoria and, and that it allows a child more time to explore their gender identity. And certainly if one uh, desires to go on to the surgical approaches, uh, it'll improve the cosmetic outcomes. Um, yet there are, are questions and concerns that can be addressed in each of these different areas. Uh, including uh, the assertion that it's a reversible um, intervention. 
because indeed we're interrupting a normal developmental process, which is a time dependent. We're dissociating puberty from the uh, um, uh, developmental task of adolescence, uh, moving from childhood to adulthood. And that even if we stop these medications after several years of use, no, we cannot turn back the clock. And so we are, are there are questions about that influence. Uh, to say that they're safe, uh, it's not based on any um, uh, clear evidence. In fact, the, the Food and Drug Administration has not approved them for use in normally timed puberty. Uh, and there are, are in, um, increasing number of studies uh, that show adverse medical effects of this intervention. For example, the time of puberty is a time where maximal bone density is accrued and, and uh, patients that have low bone density because of pubertal suppression are gonna be at risk of fractures uh, later in life from osteoporosis. And probably the most concerning is that of sterility. So that if you prevent the normal maturation of the gonad by blocking puberty, and then you follow that by cross-sex uh, hormones, the intended uh, or the expected effect, I should say, um, is that we're going to render that uh, individual um, uh, sterile for the rest of their life. And again, we're asking children at a point in their life when they really um, uh, are not able to, to make those lifelong decisions uh, about uh, their future fertility. And then there are, are many questions about this intervention as to whether it's just a pause button or rather uh, it may actually lock somebody into uh, these later interventions. And there's good data um, that uh, actually supports that concern as far as the number of people um, that get puberty blockers. In one study, nearly all of the patients um, uh, that were uh, treated uh, went on to cross-sex hormones. And then finally, you know, looking at those cross-sex hormones, um, that uh, we know that because of the biological differences between males and females, the response to medications are going to be very different. Um, uh, giving the same drug to a male is not the same thing as giving it uh, to a female. And there are, our healthcare system recognizes this and requires us in, in approving new drugs to be able to study both sexes because of that uh, understanding. And there are whole textbooks uh, written on um, sex uh, specific. Uh, effects in, in medicine. Now, what are some of the, the, the uh, known uh, risks? Um, that includes, again, I mentioned the infertility. Um, in uh, men uh, that are given estrogen uh, to appear as um, females, uh, there's a five-fold increase of, of stroke, for example. I already mentioned the bone disease, a very high incidence of metabolic changes and biological females um, getting a testosterone that increase risk of hypertension and, and uh, 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 insulin resistance and increased risk for heart attacks. Cancer risk uh, is another uh, very serious concern, both uh, from the medicines themselves and also the effects of people presenting to, the, to their provider um, with uh, uh, a sex that really is not in accord with their biology and not getting normal screening studies. Now, this is often justified in recognizing these risks in that uh, we're trying to prevent suicide so that even we can tolerate these risks uh, to prevent somebody from, uh, from dying uh, from, from that uh, depression and suicide. And here in children, we don't have the long-term data, uh, but what we can do is look to uh, data in adults. And this is uh, probably one of the most frequently studied uh, or referenced studies of a Swedish population that they were able to follow for many decades after they engaged in this affirmation approach of, of cross-sex hormones and surgery. And um, it's important to see that um, that uh, in this analysis here, and this is in Sweden where they, they record all of the patient's um, medical records, and so it's an unbiased sample. Uh, after uh, decades after receiving this affirmative approach, um, there was a 19 fold um, increase in suicide. This is completed suicides above the background population. It wasn't a controlled study or uh, a prospective uh, randomized controlled study so that we can't say whether the intervention itself caused that, but what we can say is that it didn't fix the problem. It's also important to note that the separation, this curve here is just showing you uh, death rates. So the lower uh, on the curve, uh, are the increased number of people that have had death uh, over time. And we see that that separation between those that were treated and those that were not occurs uh, about a decade into this intervention. So we're too early to understand uh, fully the, the consequences in children. Um, but I think we need to recognize that much of what is uh, being put forward 
uh, in the scientific literature is not accurate. Um, and even if the, the data with its limitation is, is being presented, the interpretation of that data um, is, is somewhat uh, and so many times very biased. This is just, I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, this is a study that just came out last year. The title of the paper uh, gives the impression that, um, that the affirmative approach, in this case surgery, will reduce mental health treatment. Uh, when the study was published, and this is again with that same Swedish population, um, it was uh, used as evidence to say that this approach was effective and it was uh, to validate uh, this means of, of, of uh, intervention. Yet there were limitations, many limitations in the study, and, and the authors were confronted with that information. And uh, there was a request, since this information was available, to directly compare those that did and did not receive surgery. And in the end of the day, um, when they did that analysis, it really showed that there was no benefit. They had already concluded the cross-sex hormones did not affect the number of people presenting to mental health care providers uh, for treatment or, or their risks of suicide. So this is a more recent paper that really really um, uh, corroborates uh, that earlier study from Sweden um, that I showed you. And then finally, in the area of, of children, uh, the last uh, study that I want to show you, and there's many that I could, um, is a, you know one that came out in, in the, one of the flagship journals of the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the journal Pediatrics, where the title of the paper uh, was that um, uh, was about pubertal suppression and the risk of suicidal ideation. And the reason I show this is because this is what is coming out in the news. So there are many reports that said that puberty blockers lower the, uh, the incidence of um, uh, suicide, and that this supports this affirmative model and the treatment uh, that, that is being performed. There were many, many weaknesses in this paper, uh, including a very uh, biased study population relying on the U.S. Uh, transgender survey, which was, again, a, an internet-based uh, uh, survey uh, which recruited people um, that, had, um, uh, that wasn't representative of the, the entire sample. Number of patients that were lost to follow up um, by design itself being a cross-sectional study uh, would not allow uh, uh, conclusions based on causations, merely associations. Yet most concerningly, when you look at the actual data in the paper itself, what they showed that uh, recent uh, suicidal ideation and attempt was actually higher, um, but not statistically significant in the patients um, uh, that did um, versus those that did not receive puberty blockers. So despite the claim uh, that it uh, supported uh, uh, the interruption of normally timed puberty, the study uh, did nothing of the sort, um, yet it continues to receive lots of attention. And there are many other areas as well. So I would um, encourage all of the those in the audience uh, to be uh, aware of these limitations in the study and, and uh, and not necessarily accept what, what you're being told as far as being the most prudent approach. There are many questions that remain. So in conclusion, I'm just going to mention that, uh, that these people that who experience a gender identity uh, discordant with their biological sex truly are suffering. We need to be able to understand that and enter into their suffering and be able to work for effective ways of, of, of dealing with that. Um, but we don't really fully understand what is the cause of this condition. Uh, and uh, we have to recognize that our current approaches uh, are heavily influenced by ideological assumptions. Uh, and uh, the scientific evidence itself is very weak. So, um, and then we have existing data that indicates that many patients continue to suffer after they uh, receive gender affirming medical interventions. And so I think we need to continue the dialogue. We need to, uh, to move away from, from the emotional rhetoric that is often presented uh, and really engage in the necessary research and look for alternative approaches to alleviate suffering in this patient population. And I'll just leave you with uh, a, a few resources that you may look to in the time that I had. I've not been able to cover all on this topic here. Um, but again, um, I look forward uh, to the question and answer segment, and I very much thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruiz. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we um, look forward to all of you in the uh, uh, participating in the audience and sending in your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, too. So, um, but now we have uh, our other speaker is Father Philip Bochansky. And Father Bochansky served for five years as chaplain for the Courage Apostolate in the 
Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Founded in New York in 1980, Courage provides pastoral care and spiritual support for Catholic men and women who experience same-sex attractions and who desire to live chastely in accord with the teachings of the Catholic Church on homosexuality. In January 2015, Father Bochansky was named Associate Director, and two years later, he was named Executive Director of Courage International Incorporated, which now includes more than 100 chapters in dioceses throughout the United States, as well as groups in 15 other countries on five continents. Father Bochansky. Thank you very much, Tom. It's a pleasure to be with you and to be able to uh, just, I hope, compliment uh, Dr. Ruse's presentation by considering the question of our pastoral care uh, and the questions of sexual identity. Um, I think perhaps a good place to start is to understand what do we mean by pastoral care. Uh, pastoral care means the care of a shepherd, imitating the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Though a pastoral minister may not know what to do in every situation, we do know what the good shepherd would do. The prophet Ezekiel, addressing the Israelites exiled to Babylon in the 6th century before the birth of Christ, relates the warning of the Lord of hosts. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been pasturing themselves. You did not bring back the strayed, nor seek the lost but you lorded it over them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered for lack of a shepherd and became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered and wandered over all the mountains and high hills. My sheep were scattered over the whole earth with no one to look after them or to search for them. As he has done several times before in salvation history, the Lord has decided on a solution to his people's plight. And so through uh, the prophet, Thus says the Lord God, I myself will look after and tend my sheep. I myself will pasture my sheep. I myself will give them rest, says the Lord God. The lost I will seek out. The strayed I will bring back. The injured I will bind up. The sick I will heal, shepherding them rightly. The Lord took the initiative to heal the most dramatic effect of suffering, the reality that links physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering to the mystery of evil and the consequence of original sin, the fact that suffering is isolating. The sick and suffering sheep were already in pain, and this reality in some degree set them apart from their family members and neighbors who were well and thus able to go about their regular duties. The prophet's rebuke, however, charges that the neglect of the leaders who shirked their responsibility to lead and feed those unable to care for themselves left the suffering sheep further scattered and more isolated. The Lord God stepped in to both lead and feed his people. Throughout this passage from Ezekiel 34, God is promising to care for and shepherd his people in his own name, to bring them back, to bind them up, and by doing so, to heal them. Of course, pastoral care takes for granted that there is a flock that needs pastoring, that needs seeking, healing, and strengthening. This is not pessimism or defeatism, but realism. Original sin, G.K. Chesterton once wrote, is a fact as practical as potatoes, and the only part of Christian theology which can really be proven. Its consequences affect the world and everyone in it every day. All of us grew up in imperfect families, had imperfect childhoods, formed imperfect friendships. We have an imperfect understanding of ourselves and an imperfect appreciation of God's gifts. We have imperfect control over our minds, hearts, and bodies, and we make imperfect responses to God's will. But the Catholic faith teaches another undeniable fact. No one needs to be perfect to be loved by God. Quite the contrary. While we were still sinners, St. Paul writes to the Romans, Christ died for us. The perfect one suffered for the sake of the imperfect, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring us to God. This reality that happiness in this life and the next depends not on perfection, but on redemption, is the foundation of pastoral care. In life, God accompanies persons, Pope Francis advises, and we must accompany them starting from their situation. 
by welcoming every person in the name of Christ and sharing with them the good news of salvation. We assist imperfect human beings to strive for the perfect happiness that has its origin and its destination in God. The key word here is striving. Our Christian life is a journey that proceeds in stages. Remember, the earliest Christians were known as those who are on the way. A Christian is not a perfect being, but a work in progress. He progresses by pursuing virtues, good habits that point him in the right direction. God has a plan for human life that is not derailed or made irrelevant by sin or imperfection. And the virtues orient heart, mind, body, and soul along the path marked out by this divine design. When we practice virtue as a consistent habit, St. Thomas Aquinas reminds us, it becomes co-natural, second nature to us, and shapes the way we think and feel and act. So our pastoral care to those who are affected by gender ideology and by a sense of discordance about their sexual identity needs to imitate the good shepherd who seeks out the lost, brings them back to the right road, and leads them along it. We are called to do this in various spheres of life, which uh, we can consider in turn, both the flock entrusted to the pastor of the parish, to the flock within the flock, which is the family, the domestic church, to the individual member of the flock who turns to the shepherd for answers and for strength. I mentioned a moment ago that our pastoral ministry is to those who are affected by gender ideology and discordance about sexual identity. And in reality, this includes nearly every member of the church. There's no denying that the question of gender identity forms a significant part of our cultural and social conversations. So naturally, it's going to loom large in the life of any parish or institution. The people of God live in the world, after all, and they bring their concerns and needs with them to church on Sunday. I'd venture to say that most priests and deacons, most pastoral ministers, uh, both religious and lay, who assist them, most teachers and, and school administrators and, and religious educators, feel at the same time compelled and unprepared to address these important issues. Astral ministers will face these questions in a variety of ways, but few opportunities will be as significant as adult faith formation. This takes many forms, informal conversations, individual instruction, RCIA, workshops and seminars for parishioners, liturgical preaching. In each of these spheres, the responsibility of the pastoral minister is the same, to speak the truth with love, as St. Paul says to the Ephesians to present the whole teaching of the church with clarity and with charity. It's fashionable among theologians of a certain mindset to claim that the Catholic church has no settled teaching on issues of gender identity. Now, the whole notion of gender identity and gender fluidity is so new that philosophers and theologians are free to make prudential judgments about opposing views in an effort to work out a solution. Now, it's difficult for me to think of a more definitive teaching than Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, male and female, God created them. So the notion that we are free to hold an opposing view in good conscience needs to be addressed. The Catechism likewise speaks in very certain terms about this issue. In paragraph 369, the Catechism says, being man or being woman is a reality which is good and willed by God. Man and woman possess an inalienable dignity which comes to them immediately from God their creator. So the church perceives our, our sexual identity, our being man or being woman, as a gift that God gives to us on purpose, with a purpose, intentionally shaping us for our life as disciples and for our vocation. Therefore, in another paragraph, number 2333, the catechism says, everyone man and woman should acknowledge and accept his or her sexual identity. Now, we need to be able to present this teaching in a, in a clear way and also in a compassionate way. Our goal, after all, is to help people not just to hear it, but to understand it, to embrace it, and to live it out. So as we teach and as we preach, our choice of words is of significant importance. As so much of our our, our observations of the culture in which, in which we live will convince us. On the one hand, 
we need to avoid simply picking up secular vocabulary, which is loaded with so much philosophical and political baggage that our congregation or, or our class or, or the people whom we're serving may end up hearing the opposite of what we're trying to convey. At the same time, we have to be aware of the situation that our listeners are coming from, the reality that they come not only with varied levels of engagement with and understanding of church teaching, but also with diverse experience of the issue in their own families and circles of friends. To cede the rhetorical ground to the culture risks diluting or distorting our message. But to insist too rigidly on technical theological terminology risks losing people whose primary connection with the topic is personal and perhaps primarily emotional. I would suggest then that we get into the habit of speaking about people who experience discordance regarding their sexual identity. I realize that this phrase seems much more cumbersome than, for example, a transgender person or trans men or trans women. But there are several benefits to this terminology, I think, which make it very useful. First of all, such a phrase puts the person at the forefront of the discussion, not the experience of gender identity discordance. This is a lesson our society has learned from the disabled community. It's much more respectful to speak of people with visual impairments than the blind. But more than mere human respect, such language highlights the dignity of the person created in the image and likeness of God and the solidarity that this identity creates among all human beings. To speak of trans people as if they were a different category of person with a different type of human nature can create the very isolation and othering that pastoral care is intended to repair. Next, to speak of the experience of discordance creates a much different context for the discussion than talking about people who suffer from or people who struggle with their sexual identity. Certainly, as Dr. Roos has already explained, this experience involves much struggle and much suffering. Indeed, it is a sharing in the cross of Christ. And we can anticipate that a person in this situation may be suffering in many ways. But blanket statements about another person's suffering most often provoke a defensive reaction. You don't even know me, Father. How can you possibly know whether I'm suffering or not? And the discussion is over before it's even begun. So we strive to pay heed to Pope Francis's admonition that in life, God accompanies persons, and we must accompany them starting from their situation. We must accompany them with mercy. Speaking of a person's experience rather than his struggle allows that person to share his own story, his own situation. When we're willing to find that starting point with our listeners, Pope Francis says, the Holy Spirit inspires us to say the right thing. Now, our choice to speak about discordance about identity rather than rejection or denial is a similar choice. It acknowledges that people come to experience gender identity discordance for a multitude of reasons that are not under that person's conscious control, that their situation is about wounds or confusion, not defiance. The APA uses the term gender identity discordance and defines it as a continuing sense that one's anatomical sex is wrong with a persistent wish to be the other sex. This phrase that go, they go on is sometimes used in place of, of gender identity disorder and transsexualism to avoid connotations of pathology. Finally, the reality about which, about which the person is experiencing uh, discordance is his or her sexual identity. Rather than the often ambiguous and politically charged notion of gender identity, which is founded on the false assumption that one's gender is fluid or disconnected from one's biological sex as male or female, sexual identity is the terminology used by the catechism to identify one's, uh, uh, to describe one's identity as male or female, and maintains the essential link of our faith that the body and the soul form a unity that we, we're not spiritual creatures just inhabiting a corporeal shell for the time that we're on earth, that it's not possible for the soul to be created and directed uh, towards one sex and the body towards the other. But that, as, the, as Catholic philosophy explains, the soul is the form of the body. The body reveals the nature of the soul. And body and soul together form the complete human being. And we understand our sexual identity and everything that flows from it 
only in the in the the in understanding that unity. Another responsibility of pastoral ministers, and particularly of those who lead parishes, is to foster the participation of individuals in the life of the local community of faith, the parish. Uh, this begins, of course, with the welcome that we have already talked about and our willingness to start from the situation of the individual. And it continues with a long-term commitment to accompany a person in his or her life of faith. But the welcome and accompaniment that the church extends is always in the context of a relationship. Our welcome has a purpose and the accompaniment is leading somewhere. The church welcomes an individual because we have something to offer to him or to her. We can see this welcome illustrated by the Lord himself in the synagogue at Capernaum on the day after he multiplied the loaves and fishes and walked on the water. As people came to him to see another miracle, he revealed himself to them as the true bread from heaven. In response to their desire for this living bread, he tells them, everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me. The welcome that Jesus extends is absolute. Come, you will not be rejected. Now, just a few verses later in that same chapter, the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, Jesus explains the purpose for this welcome. No one can come to me, he says, unless the Father who sent me draws that person, and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, he says, they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. So our role is to welcome an individual in the name of Christ with that absolute welcome, that promise that no one will be rejected, and to share with that person the saving word of God, to speak the truth in love. We draw people close because we want to share this word with them. The role of a parishioner, having received that welcome, is to respond, to enter fully into the life of the parish and the church, which means receiving the word of God, embracing it and responding to it faithfully and generously, and sharing that faith with others by word and good example. Now, the welcome that a good pastoral minister wants to extend is not facilitated by avoiding difficult subjects or pretending that one can take the church's teaching or leave it and still be happy. As the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith wrote in 1986, departure from the church's teaching or silence about it in an effort to provide pastoral care is neither caring nor pastoral. Only what is true can ultimately be pastoral, they continue. The neglect of the church's position prevents homosexual men and women from receiving the care they need and deserve. These basic principles should guide the decision of pastoral ministers in regard to including people who experience gender identity discordance in the life of the parish. In individual interactions as well as parish gatherings, respect for the dignity of the person and compassion for his or her situation is of utmost importance. The teaching of the church about people who experience same-sex attractions is applicable here as well. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says in paragraph 2358, they must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. These persons are called to fulfill God's will in their lives, and if they are Christians, to unite the sacrifice of the Lord's cross unite to the sacrifice of the Lord's cross the difficulties they may encounter from their condition. Again, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith states this even more strongly. It is deplorable that such persons have been, have been and are the object of violent malice in speech or in action. Such treatment deserves condemnation from the church's pastors wherever it occurs. It reveals a kind of disregard for others, which endangers the most fundamental principles of a healthy society. The intrinsic dignity of each person must always be respected in word, in action, and in law. At the same time, participation in the social, liturgical, and ministerial activities of the parish presupposes a willingness on the part of the individual to live in harmony with the teaching of the church, both for his or her own sake and in order to foster the faith of the whole community. If a person demonstrates by words or actions that he or she is unwilling to acknowledge and accept his sexual identity, 
then that person is not in a position to give public witness to the teaching of the church and may very easily give others reasons to be confused about or even to reject those teachings. It's not discrimination to limit the participation of people living as transgender in liturgical roles and pa parish ministries, not as a rejection of the person, but as a realistic assessment of how their situation and decisions affect others. At present, there are very few clear policies around such participation, although uh, some dioceses are developing them, particularly in light of Catholic education. I think it's imperative that our bishops create and enforce such policies, not only on the diocesan level, but for the whole country, lest we be thrown into perpetual conflict between nice Father X at Parish A, who insists that all are welcome, and mean Father Y at Parish B, who doesn't like trans people. We've seen the devastating effect that such conflicts have on other moral issues over the last several decades. And I don't have the authority to issue such policies unilaterally, but I would offer a few practical suggestions for situations that will come up in your parishes. First of all, candidates for reception into the Catholic Church as adults are preparing to profess their faith not only in the Trinity, but in all that the Catholic Church teaches and believes to be revealed by God. The catechesis that we give in RCIA must not shy away from an honest discussion of sexual complementarity as an intrinsic element of human identity and the obligation of every person to acknowledge and accept his sexual identity. The experience of sexual, of sexual identity discordance is not a sin in itself, but deliberately, persistently choosing to manifest a transgender identity is an obstacle to living out the faith fully. Coming to terms with one's sexual identity and adjusting one's behavior and presentation to con correspond to it may be something that needs to happen gradually, and we need to be sensitive to the situation of each individual. But a firm refusal to try to live in accord with one's sexual identity is an obstacle to being received into the church. It's not possible to profess faith in what the church teaches and at the same time deny a fundamental teaching of the church by one's actions. Similar considerations would apply in the case of a youth or an adult who is seeking the sacrament of confirmation. Remember that here we're talking about delaying the sacraments of initiation, not flatly denying them as a final word. As Pope Francis wrote in Amoris Laetitia, where he was referring to a person who can't participate in the sacraments because of his or her marital situation, quote, there can be some way of taking part in the life of community whether in social service, prayer meetings, or another way that his or her own initiative, together with the discernment of the parish priest, may suggest." End of quote. Sponsors for the sacraments of initiation are accepting a public role in the church, testifying to and supporting the faith of a loved one who is to be baptized or confirmed. Again, to deliberately manifest transgender attitudes and behaviors is to contradict the truth about oneself and to contradict an important teaching of the church. A person whose situation and actions are not in harmony with the church's moral teaching should not be permitted to serve as a sponsor. Blanket refusal of such persons, however, not, is not generally helpful to the individual or to the family. Rather, the request to be admitted as a sponsor can provide an opportunity to raise these important issues in a frank and honest discussion. Although it will probably be difficult at first, such a dialogue may be the start of a process of conversion and healing for the individual concerned. The proper recipients of the sacrament of sacraments of matrimony and holy orders are defined by divine law, not merely the law of the church. And sexual identity is a matter of the validity of each sacrament. People are always regarded in canon law in terms of their natural sex, notwithstanding their gender expression or any mutilation of their bodies. There's no question that a so-called trans man, a, a person born female but presenting as male, cannot be ordained, nor that two people of the same sex may not be married even if one of them identifies as transgender. Ecclesial ministry, service to the church, whether in liturgical roles or leadership in the parish or the community, is a calling, not a right. As the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has noted, quote, lay persons with a call to lay ecclesial ministry must possess certain dispositions, which are further developed during a formal preparation process. These include being in full communion with the Catholic Church, being able to minister joyfully and faithfully within the hierarchical communion that is the church, 
zeal to live a Christian life, and willingness to live and teach as the magisterium teaches. Lay ecclesial ministers, they, can, they continue, serve publicly in the local church. So they need to accept this role with fidelity and loyalty and be able to fill it with integrity, fully versed in authentic church teaching, supportive of it, able to defend it, and to present it with clarity. As, already, as I've already mentioned, the experience of confusion about one's sexual identity is not, a, not itself a sin. And a person who confides to his pastor that he's dealing with gender identity discordance need not, for that reason alone, be denied roles of service in the life of the parish. But public manifestations of sexual identity discordance, such as cross-dressing and undergoing hormonal or surgical interventions to change one's appearance, are themselves an occasion of scandal to others. As Pope Francis pointed out in Amoris Laetitia, if someone flaunts an objective sin as if it were part of the Christian ideal or wants to impose something other than what the church teaches, he or she can in no way presume to teach or preach to others. This is a case of something which separates one from the community. Such a person needs to listen once more to the gospel message and its call to conversion. So now that we've considered uh, the, the life of the parish and participation of people in the parish, uh, we should take a look at how we can extend that invitation to, uh, to, the, to hear the gospel message and to respond to its call to conversion in our interactions with individuals. All of what we've already said about sensitivity and language in the context of our preaching and teaching, about welcome that leads to dialogue and speaking the truth in love, all of this applies even more to personal pastoral interactions with people who identify as transgender or who experience uh, gender identity discordance. Where our pastoral imagination needs to reflect and develop strategies is in our interactions with those individuals who, in the midst of these feelings of discordance, are coming to the church to understand themselves and their experience more deeply and to understand how they are to accept and acknowledge their sexual identity. What do we have to say to them? How can we help? What does that acknowledgement and acceptance actually look like? My pastoral experience and instincts convince me that the most consistent, effective way to approach this question is through the lens of maternity and paternity, of motherhood and fatherhood. The cultural conversation, as we've seen, separates gender from sex and the process separating soul and body and assumes that gender roles are purely socially conditioned ideas, stereotypes that are not only outdated but oppressive. Yet faith tells us that the complementarity of the sexes is not only a biological reality but also a metaphysical one, that there are differences between men and women, physical, moral, and spiritual, that apply to every person, regardless of place, time, or culture. Pope St. John Paul II situates the reality of sexual complementarity in the reality of motherhood and fatherhood with an analysis that's worth considering carefully. I'm going to share with you a few quotations from his encyclical letter, Mulieris Dignitatem, from 1988, uh, on the dignity and vocation of woman. Motherhood, he says, implies from the beginning a special openness to the new person, and this is precisely the woman's part. In this openness, in conceiving and giving birth to a child, the woman discovers herself through a sincere gift of self. There, Pope John Paul II was quoting uh, uh, paragraph 24 of Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world from the Second Vatican Council. John Paul goes on. The scientific analysis fully confirms that the very physical constitution of women is naturally disposed to motherhood. Motherhood is linked to the personal structure of woman and to the personal dimension of the gift. In other words, every woman, by virtue of being a woman, has, all things being equal, the physical capacity to bear children, the, the, the ability to be a mother. Although both of them, father and mother, together are parents of their child, the woman's motherhood, John Paul says, constitutes a special part in this shared parenthood and the most demanding part. Parenthood, even though it belongs to both, is realized much more fully in the woman, especially in the prenatal period. 
It is the woman who pays directly for this shared generation, which literally absorbs the energies of her body and soul. This unique contact with the new human being developing within her gives rise to an attitude towards human beings, not only towards her own child, but towards every human being, which profoundly marks the woman's personality. Pope John Paul concludes, it is commonly thought that women are more capable than men of paying attention to another person and that motherhood develops this predisposition even more. So John Paul's insight is that there's a specifically ma maternal way of loving, which is connected to the physical and personal structure of the woman. This means that there's an essential connection between sexuality and vocation. Because every woman, by virtue of being a woman, is capable of becoming a mother. And because, as, uh, as um, St. Isidore says, God never gives a vocation without giving the gifts that are necessary to fulfill that vocation, then we believe that God gives every woman, by virtue of being a woman, the ability to love as a mother needs to love. In just the same way, we must say that every man, by virtue of being a man, therefore potentially a father, has been given the ability to love as a father loves. So the first thing that we ought to share with a person who is experiencing discordance about his sexual identity is the good news that God has not created him by accident, but created him with a purpose. He's made to love. Moreover, his sexual identity is not an accident either. If God has made him male, then he's made to love as a father loves, as a husband loves, as a man loves. If God has made her female, then she's made to love as a mother loves, as a wife loves, as a woman loves. Then comes the invitation and the challenge to realize and accept that one will never be happy trying to relate to others and to love others in a way different from the way one is created to love. Transitioning to the opposite, the opposite sex in an effort to find love and acceptance can never reach its stated goal. Of course, before we tell a person anything, we first need to listen. We accompany a person starting from his situation, remember. So the first thing to do is to locate that starting point. Nearly every conversation I have in pastoral care begins the same way. So tell me your story. When we begin with openness to listening, several things happen. First, the individual who has been isolated by confusion, discordance, suffering, here's an invitation for reunion. The pastoral minister is genuinely interested in what the person feels, what he wants, where he's been, where he's going. It will take time for trust to grow enough that a person can open up completely, though some people we encounter have been waiting for so long to tell somebody who might understand that they'll jump at the chance. But a pastoral minister who's a careful listener and has taken time in prayer and study to imagine where a person who experiences gender identity discordance might be coming from will be able to reflect back to the person their, the important parts of their story to help them to listen to themselves, to see their own situation through a different lens. Sympathizing with situations that must have been painful sets a person free to acknowledge the pain. Rejoicing in moments of strength helps a person to grow in confidence and an awareness of God's grace. Above all, we can help a person to reflect on where God was amid the panoply of life experiences, both good and bad, and teach that person how to pray with memories of those situations, and in so doing, communicate well with God about where they've been and where they're going. Having heard, respected, and responded to a person's relation of his or her own story, we can then help the person to evaluate that story. Gentle but firm follow-up questions. So what are you looking for? Are you finding it? Are you happy? What's making you happy? Is there something that would make you happier? Did you stop looking for what you used to look for? Have you compromised or thought, this is as far as I can go, this is as much as I can expect? These kind of questions can bring a person to an honest evaluation from within of their current situation. If they're on the wrong road, but they're able to discover that fact in their own time, by their own process, they'll be much more likely to want to know where the right road is, rather than defensively, stubbornly persisting on the wrong one. A pastoral minister then becomes a companion on the journey, having sympathized with pain 
and mourned together for lost time and lost opportunity, the pair can now seek out the right road and walk it together. This isn't the place that we don't have the time to go into a detailed description of a pastoral relationship, but a few comments hopefully will suffice. First of all, this approach is not going to be vastly different from general pastoral practice. All the skills that make a priest a good confessor or someone a, a good pastoral minister will be brought to bear here as well. In the particular realm of gender identity discordance, there will be some significant psychological issues to be faced, as you've already heard. And a pastoral minister has to, be, has to be ready to make appropriate referrals to psychologists, psychiatrists, and other professionals who are faithful to an authentic Christian anthropology to help the person deal with these issues. The most poignant of these psychological issues, it seems, is what Dr. Paul McHugh of Johns Hopkins Hospital identifies as the, uh, the underlying root of gender dysphoria. He says, most young boys and girls who come seeking sex reassignment come with psychosocial issues, conflicts over the prospects, expectations, and roles that they sense are attached to their given sex, and they presume that sex reassignment will ease or resolve them. Now, as pastoral ministers, as teachers, as parents, we can't single-handedly address or resolve these conflicts over expectations and roles, but we can help individuals to can reconsider their assumptions in light of their vocation. That is the expectations that God has for each individual and the role that he wills that each son or daughter of his should play in the family, in the church, and in the world. Faith tells us that a capacity for loving like a father or like a mother is innate, and therefore that a desire to love in that way is likewise an inborn gift from God. When we help a person to consider and appreciate these capacities and desires and to find ways to exercise them, we can expand that person's horizons and their ability to imagine what life might be like and what God has in mind. We need, therefore, to speak from experience about the goodness of spiritual fatherhood and spiritual motherhood, which are not consolation prizes, but real primordial foundational relationships of love. Such a discussion is a challenge and an invitation to get to know oneself better, to become more fully oneself by entering into loving relationships. When we reveal a person's strengths and abilities and give them a reason to consider what they might like about their created sex, rather than simply obsessing on what they hate about themselves and their situation, then healing can begin. Perhaps this method of pastoral care seems daunting. The experience of the other is foreign to our own experience, it's far easier to fear the troublesome parts than to feel confident of finding a point of understanding. It's obvious that such an approach doesn't bear fruit overnight. And perhaps we're, you may be thinking, I, I, I don't know if I have the personal or ministerial bandwidth to be able to accompany a person or many such people for the long term. And our own woundedness, we're all wounded healers after all, can provoke fear or discomfort at the thought of listening for too long to the hurts and doubts of someone else. I appreciate all these objections. I faced all of them in my own life and my own ministry. I don't think there are easy answers to any of them except to speak from my own experience. If you had told me as a seminarian or a new priest that I would be involved in this type of pastoral care full time, not only wouldn't I have believed you, I, I wouldn't have had a context in which to imagine it. But in my many years of, of ministry with courage and encourage, it's been perhaps the greatest privilege of my priesthood, the opportunity to be a real spiritual father to people who have made a choice to pursue chastity and sexual authenticity, often at the cost of being misunderstood and even losing friendships, has transformed my understanding of the human heart and my estimation of just what people are capable of when they are motivated and sustained by grace. So I trust and pray that you'll find your own pastoral ministry equally rewarding as you humbly and compassionately welcome these brothers and sisters of ours and accompany them side by side with the Lord Jesus along their path to holiness. I'm really very grateful for your participation today and for an opportunity to talk with you about how to carry out this ministry and look forward to the future when we can carry out this ministry together. Thank you. Well, and thank you very much, Father Bochansky. That was very, very helpful and informative to all of us. Now, it's time to move into our question and answer session. 
again, if you haven't noticed it already, there's a uh, little icon at the bottom of your screen labeled Q&A, and you can submit questions there based on what you've heard the speakers talk about so far. Anyway, uh, to conduct this phase of the uh, conference this morning, I'm going to turn it over to Sheila Roth at our headquarters in St. Louis, the ITES headquarters there. And Sheila has been monitoring the incoming questions during both presentations and is therefore in a position to um, uh, assign, if you want, the uh, task of answering these questions to uh, either uh, Dr. Ruse or to Father Wojcicki. Go ahead, Sheila, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you to Father Pochansky and Dr. Hoos. First question we have is directed to Dr. Hoos. How can the medical profession accept approaches that have weak support in research? In my profession, which is engineering, such weak research would not have the support to influence approaches and standards. A very good question. I, you know, I, we have to acknowledge that what we're experiencing in the area of gender dysphoria is not unique to this particular condition. There's many things that we are called to treat uh, that we don't fully have answers. What is unique in this particular area is how forcefully this one approach is being pursued uh, without consideration of alternatives uh, and other ways to intervene. Um, so that, um, you know, the evidence itself, and, and there are many uh, issues related to that, and even recognizing the low level of evidence. Many physicians, um, really, the way our healthcare system has evolved, uh, don't take the time to look at the actual evidence behind recommendations. They, they weigh very heavily upon these clinical practice guidelines without any critical evaluation. And that's, that's just, you know, looking at the Reader's Digest version. Um, so, you know, I think what we need to do is, is you know, bring to the surface, you know, this, this uh, quality of evidence and at a minimum, you know, um, engage in caution uh, to be able to ask the questions that need to be asked, uh, to be able to allow the open dialogue that we would do in any other area where we have very poor evidence. Uh, that is what goes on in medicine uh, at, in, as a whole, and it should be the same in this area. Okay, thank you. Another question for Dr. Hrus. Why did Johns Hopkins change the approach to treatment of gender transition surgeries? And was this based on scientific evidence or social pressure? Uh, so I, I, I assume that that's the referral to the reopening of their, their gender center. Certainly, as Dr. Bachansky mentioned, you know, uh, Dr. Paul McHugh, uh, who was the, the chief um, at the time when the center was shut down. Uh, and that decision was made by, based upon a number of observations, most notably that these patients uh, were not being helped uh, in, in the intervention that was being put forward. Um, you know, for the specifics, there certainly is a quite a bit of, of pressure. Uh, in fact, there are rating systems for hospitals based upon whether you are engaging in this particular care. Uh, and much of the politicization of this um, has put centers um, really in the position of um, acquiescing uh, to the demands of a very small minority of uh, ideologists and activists. Um, the specific decision, you know, I wasn't privy to, to uh, what was going on, but I do know the dynamic is present in, in uh, all major medical centers across the country as far as um, the pressure uh, to conform uh, and uh, the desire uh, not to, to go against the, uh, the current cultural conversation. Okay, thank you. Uh, question for Father Bochansky. How can one who has already been dealing with five plus years now um, with someone who was born male and has started taking hormones to become a woman change their name legally to their new female name and have started some of the process for gender reassignment? How do we bring them to Christ? Well, I think first of all, we have to um, remember that you know, for such a person, um, who may be separated from the church, who may not be uh, practicing their faith, or, or maybe it's a person who's, who's not Christian and hasn't ever heard the faith. Um, in our kind of day-to-day -day interactions, uh, we are the church to that person, right? Um, sometimes um, maybe the person who's asking the question might be the only person that can, can represent uh, 
uh, the church's teaching and, and the love of God, the love that the church has for that individual um, through, um, through their, their actions, through their words, and how, how they stay in relationship. Um, you know, I think we have to remember that it, it, it's a process that happens gradually and that uh, we, the time to uh, talk about what the church teaches, what the catechism says, what the scripture says, is when the person is ready to hear what those things, right? If we, we can easily jump the gun, um, we can easily take, I mean, I see this happen a lot with parents uh, who take kind of an emergency room approach. You know, something's wrong, What's the, where do I go? What's the right video? What's the right brochure? What's the right book to read? What's the right homily to listen to that's gonna get my kid to straighten out and figure all this out? It's not like that. It's people don't work like that, you know. But but we stay in communication. We treat them with with love and respect, and at the same time, we have you know clear uh, understanding with them of what we can support and what we can't, you know. And and that can be infuriating at first. Well, you say that you love me, but you don't support this, or you say that you um, you know that you want to be in my life, but you won't accept this. Um, but if we can gently, cheerfully, you know, respond by making it about uh, about what they're asking us to do, and not about the person themselves. In other words, I do love you, and we we disagree on this 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 uh, part of your of your experience. You disagree on on the decisions you're making, but we don't have to agree on everything for me to love you. And and I hope that that you're not asking me to violate my conscience to say something that's the opposite of what I believe to be true for the sake of you accepting my love any more than I would ask you to do that. Right? And so when we can, we, we keep the communication open uh, by patience, by mercy, by cheerfulness, by love. And eventually, I mean, the truth itself is attractive, right? And, and when we're living the gospel fully, it's attractive. And I think eventually it leads a person to, to say to himself or herself, how is it possible that, you know, she's going to keep this, this strict line on what she believes and doesn't, what she accepts and doesn't, but she still treats me as well as she does? Like, why doesn't she hate me? Why hasn't she kicked me out yet? Why hasn't, why hasn't she just told me, like, I have to shape up? I, that's what people expect the church to do. Heaven knows there are enough examples of pastoral ministers and others in the church who have done that to people. Um, but when we can continue to show love and support and continue to stay true to what we, what we believe and where our, where our conscience makes those good boundaries for us, then the hope is that eventually a person will come and ask, like, tell me more about what you believe because you stick to it even though I don't like it, but you don't hate me and I don't know how this works. So what's this all about? And in that case, we may have a chance to speak more fully about the, about the truth. And then we can have the kind of conversation I mentioned, you know, talk about the goodness of complementarity, the goodness of uh, this person having been created male by God, uh, the, the reality of spiritual fatherhood, and those kind of things. But, but I think, you know, first we lay the foundation by the way we treat a person, uh, then hopefully they'll, they'll come and ask and then we can share the truth with them. Great, great, great advice. Another question, how do we enter into a compassionate conversation regarding gender identity without denying who they are? Invalidation can be isolating and mentally defeating. How do we enter into empathetic conversations, practicing our Catholic faith without invalidating or isolating people who are struggling with identity? Well, I think first of all, to, to um, just be calm about, you know, the idea that, um, some people are afraid. I think that that if I if I don't correct things right away, then I'm condoning it, right? And so I don't think that's true. I think I think you know we can we have to give a person the, the space to tell his or her own story. And really, that's the most effective thing that I found in pastoral ministry is just to say, "Tell me what's going on," you know. And 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 with something like gender uh, identity discordance, it's perfectly true and legitimate to say. This is not my experience. I don't know anything about what this feels like from the inside. I need you to share this with me when you're ready and to the extent that you can. But I really, I want to know what this is like for you because I love you, because I, I care about you. And, you know, I, I want to know as much as I can about you. Um, you know, and then to listen and listen and listen some more and, and resist the urge to, 
you know, it's oftentimes we can, we can be in a conversation and as the other person's talking, we're ready, we're getting our answer ready, right? We're just waiting for them to take a breath so we can jump in. This is a case where we really need to give a person space um, and take their story seriously. You know, sometimes I find that, you know, taking someone's story seriously is, the, is an impetus for them to take their own story seriously, maybe for the first time. You know, someone who's kind of swept along by the culture, who's got a lot of um, confused feelings and, and kind of takes on the label, whether it's uh, LGBT or gay or trans, um, because the label seems to be a quick explanation. But then maybe they haven't kind of followed things, even their own thoughts to their logical conclusions. If we give them a chance to talk, then they start to, it starts to become clear either, even to them. And uh, I think the more that we can listen, um, that validates the person's dignity and, and our love for them. And then we can say, well, now listen, you mentioned this. I, I think, I mean, I don't, I, I see it differently. Can we talk about the way that I'm looking at it? And then we can share the faith with them in such a way that it's really a dialogue and not just, uh, I'm waiting, uh, waiting for the buzzword so that I can jump on it and score points and, and convince you. Great answer. Thank you. Um, this one's a little bit longer, but um, here we go. If hormonal development in the fetus results in the biological organs that are distinctively male or female, what is known today of the influence of hormonal activity on the psychological formation, influencing the sense of self of the developing fetus? Could this more hidden hormonal activity be the basis for what is called sexual dysphoria, when the psychological sense of the self differs from the biological manifestation. Could this condition, approximately 1.5 million in the US, if shown to be scientifically accurate, be a call to the church to offer a distinct ministry to such persons? Well, that's to you, Father Bachinsky. Oh, I, maybe if Dr. Roos could start with the, uh, the question of hormonal development, I can jump sure. in at the end. Sure. You know, from, from, from the standpoint, um, so that is a, a, an active hypothesis uh, that the hormonal uh, influences uh, that contribute you know, to this experience. And I, I think we shouldn't be too ready to dismiss that. I think that there's, there's probably good basis for that. Um, but whether the question is whether that's determinative or whether that merely influences that condition. And I can give you one example um, that probably is the easiest to understand. Uh, and that's the condition of uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And so uh, females that have this condition uh, are exposed in utero uh, to very high levels of, of male hormones, androgens. Uh, and the experience that those individuals have had um, is that they do have behavioral differences. And so many would describe them as tomboyish type behaviors. Uh, prior to the uh, uh, current discussion that we have about you know, gender dysphoria, the vast majority of them didn't question their sexual identity. They, they understood themselves to be female, yet they had uh, behavioral preferences uh, that would, many would uh, classify as, as being more masculine. So I think that there are certainly, there's evidence that there are uh, in influences. And I think there's a, a tremendous need to understand better what are all of the factors, not just environmental, uh, but also, uh, you know, genetic uh, and societal as well to come to that understanding. But I think ultimately that doesn't change one's sexual identity and it, and it um, doesn't necessitate, you know, carving out um, a separate category for these individuals. Uh, they are part of the human community. And, you know, again, that we can certainly not understand them as, as male or female that have had these other influences. And I think from a pastoral point of view, theological point of view, um, it's not necessary or frankly possible for the church to kind of change its moral teaching or change its anthropological teaching, um, even if science would, would prove this hypothesis that there are these hormonal influences on a person's uh, sense of their sexual identity. Um, you know, we still, uh, the goal really is in through opportunities like this, to form people in the church to be particularly aware and sensitive of the the the, uh, the, the setting and the challenges faced by someone in this situation. Um, you know, I think uh, this is something I, I, I mentioned uh, um, in a conference the other day. Um, you know, our understanding of sexual identity uh, is very much a part of our pro-life teaching as well, right? We recognize uh, the individual human person uh, to exist from the moment of conception. 
And long before, you know, that person's genitals are formed or they're, uh, they're exposed to, to hormones, you know, at later in their fetal development, from the moment that that person exists and that person's body exists with just one cell, um, that one cell has the same DNA as that all the other cells that that person will ever have uh, is going to contain. And that one cell on the last pair of chromosomes has a marker that indicates whether that person is male or female. Um, and so there are, um, there are various disorders of development, various conditions regarding hormones and, and other things that happen later in life, even while still in the womb, not a whole lot later, but later. Uh, but from that moment that a person exists, um, he or she is created as male or female, not as some kind of ambiguous or androgynous being that could develop in either direction. God creates us um, when he infuses the soul into the body that our parents helped him to create. Um, both soul and body are, are sharing that, that sexual identity of the individual from, from that first moment. Okay, thank you. This one is directed to Dr. Hoos. In reference to the study on suicide that showed 19-fold increase in suicide among those being treated with hormones, et cetera, I'm assuming that was in comparison to people who have not been diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Are there any studies which compare suicide rate of those treated to those diagnosed but not treated? Um, so it's correct. Uh, the 19-fold the increase is above the background population, meaning those that do not experience uh, this uh, sex gender identity discordance or gender dysphoria. Um, in fact, the paper that I mentioned uh, by the lead author, Brandstrom, that was published this last year, uh, had some hint of that, although I want to, you know, um, have a little bit of caution in how we interpret that data, so that um, in that uh, data set, when they compared those that had uh, surgical uh, interventions and those that did not, uh, the actual relative risk, uh, if you had the surgery, was actually a 1.9, which means that it was uh, almost twice as, as high of uh, being hospitalized for suicide attempt. Um, yet that was not statistically significant. So uh, the, the best you can say is that there was no difference. Um, one could argue that those that have the surgery and those that, that do not are not the same population so that they may have different uh, degrees or, or different issues going on. Um, the, the problem is that most of the studies, um, nearly all of them really um, don't have that trial design to compare those that do and those that do not. And so that when they draw upon uh, the comparison, they're not doing it in the way that you can actually draw those conclusions. But if the goal is to alleviate suffering, I think it is important to look at what the outcome is after the intervention. And the way it's being portrayed uh, in the media and the conversation is that uh, by affirming somebody um, that you're going to fix the problem. And now, and when it doesn't work out that way, then the assertion is it's because of social stress. It's meaning that the, because other people don't accept me for who I am, that is the reason why I'm still um, you know, suffering. Um, but, you know, we, we have to, you know, look at, um, you know, the, the net effect is that it didn't fix the problem. Uh, there's data that actually challenges that social hypothesis, uh, you know, that, that when you look at communities that are tolerant and those that are less tolerant uh, of uh, people that are, are gender diverse, really you see the same outcome. Uh, and so there's many questions still out there uh, in limited research, but what is there um, in that comparison in a limited way with the caveats that I mentioned would suggest um, that this affirmation approach is is not um, improving the situation, or at least uh, one can say it's not fixing the problem. Okay, another question for Dr. Hoos. Doctor, do you feel the medical community is supported in expressing opinions and data that is not supporting the current transgender agenda? I'm worried that factual accurate information is being silenced due to a more open-minded view. I am in the direct counseling field and have strong medical voices support me in conferences and in individual situations. Please hold your peers accountable and I will do the best in my field. How likely is research based on their funding source? So many uh, aspects to that question. And, and I, I think this is a concern. I think this is a major concern that the scientific dialogue that would normally occur 
uh, is not occurring, uh, and that there is an uh, active suppression of, of one questioning uh, what, you know, this, this current uh, affirmation-only paradigm. Uh, it, it, it certainly is my experience uh, at uh, professional meetings uh, as well. Um, and, and many times, you know, to not look at the data itself, um, but when challenges are made about the interpretation of the data, um, to really rely on ad hominem attacks and, and, you know, to, again, this whole conference is directed toward uh, understanding the, the relationship, you know, between faith and reason. Um, so the, it's often leveled that the, the, that the conclusion being made or the, the assertion about the poor quality science is made, you know, from a religious perspective, not from a scientific perspective. And that should be of concern. And I think that if this continues uh, beyond the transgender uh, area, I think we, you know, our whole medical establishment is, is um, really, um, you know, challenged. So, uh, you know, there is a need, um, you know, to, to be able to have that discussion. We pride ourselves on evidence-based medicine. That's, we often uh, assert that as that's how we operate. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that is, you know, for the good of, of all of the practice of medicine, that's something that needs to, to be done. All right, thank you. There was a series of comments in the chat room that Jesus never spoke of these issues and Father Bochanski would like to address that. So go ahead. Yeah, I, I think um, it's a fairly common objection whether we're talking about um, questions of, um, of gender dysphoria or uh, uh, homosexuality uh, for people to say, well, you know what Jesus said about homosexuality? Nothing. And so you have to just leave it alone and you know, it's somehow unchristian. Um, to have uh, teachings or expectations or rules about that. Now, I mean, the short answer uh, to that is, well, Jesus also didn't say anything about uh, nuclear weapons or internet pornography or, um, or, or airplanes or, or rocket ships, but we, have, we can apply the church's teaching uh, to all of those things and their moral use and, and, uh, and all sorts of other modern uh, realities. That's what the church does, the, the, the teaching office of the church, the magisterium, um, has the responsibility to, under, to interpret the scripture uh, and to interpret uh, the word of God as it's handed on in sacred tradition and to develop it when necessary so as to apply uh, these um, age or really eternal truths to modern situations. But with specific reference to the scripture, I think, um, you know, to say, well, Jesus never said anything about this, misunderstands who Jesus is and how the sacred scripture works. Um, you know, we believe that God is ultimately the author of the entire scripture from the first word of Genesis to the last word of the book of Revelation. We believe that Jesus is God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. And in fact, uh, as St. John calls him, he is the word. Uh, so that, you know, he's, he's really, um, he embodies the truth that's contained in all the scriptures. Um, so the Old Testament, although it was written, put down on paper by human authors many centuries before the birth of the incarnate word in time, is very much the word of God and the word of Jesus. Um, everything that, that is said, for example, in the Mosaic law about uh, homosexual relations um, is a is, is is authored, if you will, by Jesus Himself. It, it comes from Him. Um, moreover, in the the Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus says at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, "I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I, I've I've come to fulfill them." And not the smallest part of a letter of the law of Moses will pass away until everything is fulfilled. So. Right there in the gospel, he affirms all of the moral provisions that are contained uh, in the Mosaic law. And in fact, in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, he actually goes deeper. He says, you've heard that, uh, you've heard the, the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, don't even lust after someone in your heart because you've already committed adultery in your heart. Um, so the Lord is, is taking um, the, the, the law that's expressed in, in the Old Testament uh, as still very much in effect and, and as the foundation for the new law of love, the gospel law of love. Um, then in the New Testament, we have uh, St. Paul, uh, who tells us over and over again that he received the revelation that he, sh that he teaches directly from the Lord Jesus, right? And especially, I think, when he's talking about 
issues of sexual morality, he'll say, you know, I've had this word from the Lord. And so when St. Paul teaches about, uh, the, about sexual morality in general and about homosexuality in particular, um, when he teaches about the nature of the human person, the nature of marriage, you know, we, we accept all that as being inspired by the Holy Spirit and as being part of the revelation that he's received from the Lord. Now, some of your listeners are thinking, well, yeah, but the Mosaic law, we don't uh, keep kosher anymore and we don't worry about um, uh, mixing our threads or uh, touching dead animals or things like that. And there's a good, uh, that's a good point. Um, there's many parts of the Mosaic law uh, in terms of the uh, liturgical and uh, sacrificial precepts in terms of uh, kind of rules for clean and unclean that we don't keep anymore. Um, but the reason that we don't is because of something that's recorded in Acts chapter 15, sometimes called the Council of Jerusalem. St. Paul and St. Barnabas had been evangelizing the Gentiles, and the question was, should they be circumcised and become Jewish and observe the Jewish law in order to be Christians? And so they came back to Jerusalem, met with Peter and James and John and the other disciples, um, and as the result of what, what is kind of like the first ecumenical council in the church, um, Peter, speaking on behalf of the others, um, and, and James, uh, who's the Bishop of Jerusalem, um, they announced, you know, we've, we've come to a decision. It's our decision and the Holy Spirit's decision. And they put it in the form of a letter uh, to the Gentiles. The decision of the Holy Spirit and us is not to impose on you any obligations other than what is strictly necessary. And then they mention four things. Three of them have to do with, with food, Right? So most of the kosher laws are gone, but you still can't eat meat that's sacrificed to idols, meat that's strangled animals, or uh, meat that's mixed with blood. And the fourth is, uh, is the law about sexual union right? and what's proper and improper in terms of sexual morality. So the apostles themselves, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, did dispense for most of the, 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 uh, the smaller uh, liturgical or traditional laws uh, from the Old Testament, but they specifically kept the, the Old Testament laws of sexual morality intact. So both um, in the words of Jesus and in the example of his uh, apostles um, and in the, the whole revelation that the word of God contains, um, Jesus is very clear that that sexual morality that's expressed there uh, is is his teaching and that it's it's binding on us. Okay, thank you. A couple of questions that are related. What should my reaction be when approached by the parents of a child experiencing gender dysphoria or when approached by a young person or a child? And related to that, how can parents help support a teen who is identifying as transgender? What should we do? Well, I think, first of all, don't panic, right? Um, because children pick up on the, um, the emotions of the adults in their lives. Um, and, um, you know, they can get very scared and as a result kind of dig in to, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, dig into distorted feelings about themselves, whether they're quote unquote normal or not. And, you know, on the, the other side of that equation, um, parents, I don't think, should just assume that because a child uh, expresses, you know, on a given day um, that they, they have these, these feelings of, you know, I, I'm a boy, but I want to be a girl, that that automatically means that some, uh, you know, some foundational reality of that child has been revealed and now everything has to um, change because of that. I mean, not to, I don't mean to make light of, of the reality of gender identity discordance, but, you know, a small child uh, one day will be, you know, uh, an astronaut and the next day uh, is, you know, a superhero and the next day is a dog and the next day is a princess, you know, and kids imagine things and, and, and play make-believe and, and uh, I don't think we have to, to kind of, uh, you know, take one word or, or one kind of phase in their life in isolation as, as the defining moment. Um, you know, as Dr. Roos pointed out, the, the desistance rate um, for children who, um, who's, who don't have any particular intervention other than uh, calm, cheerful parents, you know, who, you know, encourage uh, good uh, imaginative play and, 
and also encourage their children to, um, you know, to understand their, their, uh, how they're made and what their bodies mean and, and who they are, um, that many children who, um, uh, who experience uh, what seems like gender identity discordance before puberty, um, they, it's resolved when they hit puberty. And, and for the small percentage where it's not kind of uh, automatic like that, uh, interventions that focus on understanding one's body, understanding what one's body reveals about one's sexual identity can be very useful and very helpful. Um, so I think, you know, we're dealing with small children, especially, um, you know, to, to give them time and, and to take a step back and not to follow the example of the culture and jump to conclusions that everything is changing now. Um, with teens, I think, you know, it, there's a, they, teenagers experience just a lot of, of inner turmoil about identity and, their, and what, you know, who they are and what sex means and what it's for. They experience that confusion and turmoil in the best of situations, right? And so I think to, to give them an opportunity to just talk about what they're feeling, to put some words to it, instead of just slapping a label on it and saying, that's why I feel what I feel, because I belong to this category. Um, you know, it's very attractive because the category has a label and an acronym and a flag and a section in the Pride Parade and a website. And, you know, it's easy to say, well, this is why people don't understand me because I'm this particular category. But to, not in, to encourage young people not to use labels, uh, but rather to, to talk and put, put, put words on what they're feeling and then you know, share experience when possible and, and, and just explore you know, what could those feelings mean other than I'm suddenly you know, revealed to be the opposite of who God made me to be. Good. Uh, Dr. Roos wants to chime in on that maybe as well. But. I think you did a great job. Cool. Thanks. Okay, here's a question for Dr. Hughes. As a person in the medical field, how do I professionally care for a person who requests to be referred to by their gender identity, accepting their preferred pronouns, etc.? I really struggle that the medical field and quote science might force me to deny reality by referring to patients according to their gender identity when I am going to medically treat their issues based on their biological sex, how do I balance reality with respecting their wishes? You know, I think it's uh, very, very important, um, you know, to be able to approach any patient that, that comes in, and this includes people that experience this gender identity uh, sex discordance, um, you know, with, with the utmost of, of dignity, uh, and to welcome them. You know, it's very well known that, that people avoid medical uh, approaching practitioners independent of, of uh, requests for intervention related to gender dysphoria. Uh, but even for routine screening and immunizations for the fear uh, that they're going to be rejected. Uh, and so that, um, you know, the, it is possible and um, it's part of what we do as physicians uh, to be welcoming and to be able to um, reinforce that dignity and our desire to care for them and their needs, which doesn't necessitate um, even that, um, that, uh, that our understanding of what they're experiencing is different than, than what their, their lived experience of, of, what, of what they're having. So how do you approach that in a practical way? Uh, one of the ways that I've approached this, you know, without, um, uh, is, is really to, to welcome them. Uh, many times one can use uh, their preferred names because naming, you know, there are many names that uh, people have that can be interpreted uh, as male or female. So that's not acquiescing or saying anything about who they are as a person. In my own personal experience uh, in using pronouns, um, that it does change the way that you think uh, and in a way that may actually be detrimental to their best interest as far as medical care. Uh, so that, um, as I mentioned before, you know, the risks that are for not doing regular care that are, are unique for, for one sex versus another. Um, and that's at the same time, you know, with the uncertainty uh, in the information that we have, uh, I think it's very possible to, to segregate that out. Be, to be able to be a good physician, and I think that to be a good pastor, I would imagine as well, Father Bochanski can speak on this as more, uh, but, you know, that, that you have to build that relationship. Uh, you know, when somebody comes to somebody uh, for care, 
Uh, physicians see patients in the most vulnerable of places. And, and we do things with our patients that, that would not be experiences they would have elsewhere. And they're very much making themselves vulnerable. And somebody that's experiencing uh, gender dysphoria is hypersensitive uh, to that feeling of rejection. And they're gonna be very guarded in being able to come forward and even sharing important history information that's gonna be essential for the physician to deliver good uh, care. So I think that, that what physicians learn in medical school should not be discarded. And that we need to know that we're developing a relationship with this individual uh, and to be as welcoming as we can. Uh, and I think that the same principle uh, you know, applied to pastoral care uh, begins with listening. We always take a history. And in that history, uh, we try not to, to, to um, we leave it open-ended when we begin the conversation. We need to then narrow down into specifics, but we let a patient tell their story. That's how we understand um, you know, what their needs are. And that's how we then build this relationship so that we can best care for them. I, all physicians, no matter what their training is or what their specialty uh, is, uh, are very likely now uh, to encounter individuals that have this condition. And I think that that's uh, a prudent approach that really doesn't go beyond anything that we learned in medical school, um, but is often forgotten. Okay, thank you. Um, it's 10.55 Central Time. Tom, do we want to uh, wrap things up or should we take one more question? I think we'll do one more question. Uh, here's one more for Dr. Hrus. Is there a credible scientific evidence that since the advent of the use of hormonal contraception and its it, subsequent environmental ramifications, i.e. showing up in water systems, that conditions like gender dysphoria are increasing? Might the use of synthetic hormones and the plastics that also mimic sex hormones be contributing to the confusion? This is a whole active area of research known as endocrine disruptors. Uh, and I, I think that it is something that's worthy of discussion. When we look at the rapidity though, with which we've seen this explosion of people coming forward with this condition, um, it, it temporarily doesn't correlate uh, with, with the exposure uh, to hormonal contraceptives. So that's not to say that there may not be an influence. Uh, and there certainly are effects on the endocrine system uh, and the way the body functions uh, in many uh, uh, aspects, uh, menstrual fu uh, function, fertility, uh, in other areas um, that are important to understand. But I, I think that if there is a role uh, of these uh, synthetic hormones uh, in contributing to the, um, you know, the, the presentation, uh, it's merely a, a component of that. Uh, and I think the best evidence that we have is that the societal influences uh, uh, far outweigh um, any potential influences from that uh, particular um, contributor. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's do one more question. Are there, are there any studies or suggestions on supporting the suffering of loved ones and parents who are dealing with children with gender dysphoria? I am seeing considerable suffering that feels like it is being ignored and dismissed by the medical community. Very briefly, the whole rationale for, for medical intervention is based on a recognition of that suffering. So I think that's the whole basis of, of why the medical profession has been engaged in this. Uh, and um, you know, there, there, are, there is literature um, that addresses um, the, the suffering, the psychological suffering that people experience. Um, yet um, oftentimes, uh, you know, the, the, um, that component is, is often um, uh, dismissed um, or it, there's a, a move to move away from considering those uh, underlying issues that perhaps might have contributed, um, you know, to the presentation. Uh, and, and it's seen as a barrier to getting the hormones that the patient uh, requests. Uh, and um, so I think that, um, you know, to do good medicine, uh, that's what any good uh, psychologist or psychiatrist, you know, would, would approach a, a patient that walked into their door wanting to understand uh, all the contributors that might have happened in that person's life that, that might have, have uh, uh, led to this um, development. Uh, and, and that includes an understanding of, of suffering, both psychologically and physical as well. 
And Sheila, I think uh, part of the question was about the suffering that parents go through um, when their children are, are presenting them with this reality in their life. And um, we've had some experience already and uh, we'll probably have much more at uh, the Courage Apostolate through our Encourage uh, chapters. Um, you know, courage is primarily for people who experience same-sex attractions, but uh, an encourage is for parents, siblings, um, spouses, other loved ones um, who come to us with the question, how do I keep the faith and keep my family intact? And so um, our encourage groups more and more are welcoming people whose loved ones don't, have, don't identify as gay or lesbian, but as transgender or genderqueer. And um, and we find that for them, in many, in many ways, the suffering is the same. And so we try to help them with shared prayer, with opportunities to share their experiences with other parents, to learn from them. Uh, and really to, um, you know, a big part of our approach is to develop a life of prayer uh, in which people can hand over to the Lord the things that they'd like to fix or solve or, or resolve that, that they certainly can't on their own, to, to grow in trust and hope that that their loved ones who may be going through very difficult situations are certainly not out of the reach of God's providence or his love. Well, okay. thank you thank very you. much to both of our panelists, to Sheila for your help with the questions and so forth. But it is time now to wrap up the webinar since we told people it was 10 to 12 or 9 to 11 central time. Um, I want to remind all of your attendees that when you registered for this register webinar, you went to the iTest website www.faithscience.org. Well, we invite you to check out more features on our website, including past webinars, publications, and how to join iTest as a regular member. That's www.faithscience.org. So I thank all of you for attending. I hope this event has been a very valuable learning experience for you. And I'd now like to call upon Sister Carla May Streeter to conclude with our closing prayer. Most Holy One, you have a shepherd's heart. Grant that we, your people, might have a shepherd's heart. You see the depths of the human being our view is not perfect. You welcomed sinners, you welcomed broken people, you welcomed those who were suffering unimaginable pain. In your graciousness, send your spirit among us so that we might be welcomers. That we might not turn away from those who suffer on the way. You have a plan. You have a plan for all you have made. Help us to be part of your plan, not to think we can make our own. You reject nothing that you have made, but delight in it. In your great mercy, send us from here as people of compassion, as people with your own shepherd's heart. We ask this for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Once again, thank you all for attending. <laughs>